The following podcast contains spoilers and is spooky as f. <laughs> Everybody and welcome back to another Spooktober special. It's the end of the month, and what a month it's been. Have you had fun, Noosk? I have. You and have? I, I think you should start with, hey, Halloweenies, <laughs> <laughs> as per our Lord and Saviour Ned Flanders. <laughs> <laughs> so, we got one episode left, and it's a zombie film. Mm. So, I've decided that tonight we are going to watch Night of the Living Dead. Oh, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> that can't be true. Um, it's a film. <laughs> okay. George A. Romero's absolute masterpiece, 1968. Not the first zombie film, but widely regarded as the first modern zombie film, for sure. So this is the first film where we get to see zombies as we know them today. Hmm. Okay. So are they referred to as zombies? They are not. Oh, interesting. <laughs> All right. How old is it? 1968, so it's 53 years old this year. Wow. Is it yeah. all in black and white? It is in black and white. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Pumped. <laughs> all right. So, Night of the Living Dead, as I said, is directed and written by George A. Romero, a co-written by John Russo. It stars Dwayne Jones, Judith O'Day, Marilyn Eastman, Carl Hardman, Judith Ridley, and Keith Wayne. Uh, cinematography and editing also by Romero, independent film, made, on a, bu- Sorry. made on a budget of only $114,000, brought back in $30 million at the box office. $30 million? Yes. So it Holy did, shit. It did quite the good deal, this film. <laughs> yeah. um, it's quite the profit. It garnered a cult following and critical acclaim. It's appeared on lists of the greatest films ever made by outlets such as Empire, New York Times, and Total Film. Really? Yep. And in 1999, it was deemed culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant by the Library of Congress and selected for preservation in the National Film Registry. Aw, cute. So, and you know nothing about this film. No. I mean, I'm like, if someone had said to me, have you seen Night of the Living Dead? I wouldn't be like, what? That's a thing. I've heard of it, but. Okay. All right. I don't like horrors. Good well, thing is I probably won't be scared. Well, tonight It's too here. old timey for that. Oh, my God. <laughs> the legend, uh, Tim, down at the bottle shop, who I messaged a couple of weeks ago saying, do you have any spooky themed beers? <laughs> Was good enough to throw aside for me a zombie pop, which is a raspberry sour beer, which I've been saving just for this occasion. <laughs> And Tim was like, you're the worst. (laughs) (laughs) Shall we crack into it then? Well, hang on, hang on. I also have a drink of choice. Oh, do you? Yes. Your mother has ordered and bought me a unicorn blood strawberry flavoured vodka. Interesting. By Unicorn Distilleries, I believe. Okay. Yeah, so I am also drinking on theme this evening. There you go. Mm. No unicorns in this film, sadly. (laughs) That does make me sad. He wanted to put them in, but they were too hard to catch. Ah, classic. (laughs) All right, shall we crack into it then? Yeah. Let's get spooky. Come on, Halloweenies. (laughs) All right. Night of the Living Dead, absolute masterpiece. Did you enjoy that film? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, shit. <laughs> right mean, out the gate. Yeah, yeah, I did in the end. Um, is, by the end of it, I was like, oh, cool. I, I can see what people are talking about now. <laughs> is this the film you enjoyed least out of the five? Possibly. Oh, shit. <laughs> I don't know. I just, yeah, wow. it took a long time to get into the for one, me. The one that's in the Library of Congress, that's that's the one you like the least. <laughs> I mean, again, proves the point. Why do you have me here? (laughs) (laughs) So, okay, let me ask you the first question. Were you scared? Did this film scare you at any point? Never, except when the arms came through the window suddenly and grabbed him. I actually jumped, completely scared, jumped. Yeah. So, there you go. I was 
I was I was all arrogant, like this won't scare me, and then I <laughs> screamed and jumped. So there you go. But otherwise, not at all. Do you think that part of that might just be? And we spoke about this a little bit with with Dracula about you know maybe it's that Dracula's not really all that scary a character. Do you think that maybe like would do, do you see yourself being scared if if there were a real horde of zombies outside? I mean, a horde of zombies is scary, as the film proves. One zombie, yeah, just walk a little faster. I think that's the <laughs> thing with zombies. It, it's it's similar. It works on a similar scale to birds for me. One to two birds, you could fight off. What? Why are you Multiple thinking about birds? fighting birds? Because I hate birds. That's such <laughs> but but dumb think about reaction it. to things. Think about it. Fifty to a hundred birds all trying to attack you. There's nothing you could do. Zombies work on the same scale. The more of them there are, the scarier they are. Um, unless there is like, hey, what what's a flock of magpies called? That's the only time you really need to be worried because magpies genuinely do attack humans. But it's magpies only one time because they're swoopy little. C-s. They're very territorial, only for a certain time each year. I mean, wouldn't You're that fine. be weird though? Wouldn't wouldn't it be strange if if zombies were like a territorial creature that like every spring you just had to look out for? Yeah. Like it was just one of those things. And like, just oh, give no, a wide berth. Don't take that path. <laughs> yep. Zombies down there. Yeah, that'd be that'd be all right. <laughs> wouldn't be such a national state of emergency then. So you are not a horror film watcher, as we know. Have you not seen that many zombie films? Would this probably be one of the first you've actually seen? I guess so. We re-watched it tonight as a little recap, but I saw Treehouse of Horrors zombie episode. <laughs> and I've seen episodes of The Walking Dead, but no. So, I, again, because though, you're not that familiar me. with it. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Do you think that the originality of it actually... You weren't struck by it particularly? Oh, I mean, I, I was knowing that this was kind of like the first... Um, I was like, hey, this is pretty cool. Um, once once there was more people involved in the storyline and there was a plan of attack sort of forming and there were other characters to bounce off, I was more invested in the story. Um, prior to that, I was a little bored. Okay, well, let's get to the story then. This is, to me, one of those classic horror stories that has become a bit of an archetype now where you get a group of characters and the goal is to survive. Sure. Yeah. You get it's you a know, great story five line. to ten characters in a room. And the great thing about that is the budget constraints as well. The entire thing takes place in this one house. Only you would think of that though. And there's just these people well, I mean that's a big thing for horror, honestly. Like mm, mm. particularly you look at this film, horror as a genre to a large extent was built out of how can we make a film for the cheapest amount of money? You look at a film like <laughs> The Blair Witch Project or Paranormal Activity, there's a big tradition of that with mm. horror. And I think that's, that's in some ways why this sh- film works so well is because it is bottled so nicely and the antagonists are just humans. And that's what's effective about it and what's scary about it is that they don't even go too far out of their way for the most part to make them look dead. And I think that's why the no. effects hold up so well is yeah. that they're just people who have died and that is what's scary about it. Mm. I liked all the different sort of, you know, some of them were half naked. Some, well, of course, there was one totally naked and, of course, it was a woman. Well, you've got to get some boobs in there. Yeah. There were some topless guys as well. Oh, great. Cool. It's not the same. Yeah, from the moment the music started – this will sound so awful to people who are like, I love film. But I was just like, Ugh, this film's old. <laughs> and not in a good way. Um, having said that, later on, I thought the sound, some of the sound design was pretty clever. Um, at first, and for many parts of the film, the music was so distracting. Oh, no, really? No, they were going for spooky, weird, you know, uh, but I was just like, shush. I actually not. really love the score to this film, and I think it's really nicely experimental in the way that it will completely change its tact for different mm. atmospheres. You know, like, there's a lot of the film that is very classically orchestrally scored, mm. And then every time there's a kind of moment of horror or gore, you get this very electronic synthy drone. It that sounded just- a bit alien-like, and mm. I just didn't feel like that necessarily worked for grounding it in the horror of their reality. Yeah, okay. It sort of made it like extra spooky. What else could be happening? 
are we in space? No, stop it. Okay. Um, having said that, though, I'm sure if I was back in the day watching this film and there was nothing else like this around, it would have been amazing. So I'm you- just judging it with my, you know, 2021 eyes, which is rude. So, you know that this film is 10 years more recent, though, than Dracula that we watched. Yeah, right. Why is it still in black and white then? <laughs> I mean, budget. Budget restraints. Why is yeah. Clerks in black and white? And that's only a 25-year-old film. Yeah, right. I don't, I don't want to talk about Clerks with you. <laughs> <laughs> You've got podcast friends for that. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I thought the um, font choice of the um, you know name of the film coming up was interesting. Night is kind of uh, outlined and then Of the Living Dead is just this sort of fairly standard. I wondered what the choice was there behind that. Yeah, this is one of those films for me where I think, so not only is it quite an indie film, it's it's a directorial debut. George Romero had never made a film before. Mm. Um, I feel that sometimes. <laughs> and I think sometimes- <laughs> Who am I to judge? <laughs> sometimes that lends itself to choices that- are so unique and interesting. Film critics for decades have been picking this film apart, what they think it means and, you know, what the themes are and stuff. Mm. And nearly every time George Romero comes out and goes, oh, that means nothing. <laughs> and that <laughs> I find that really interesting and, and quite humbling of him to not be like, oh, yes, well. <laughs> that, is, that is, in fact, what I intended. <laughs> but, like, honestly, maybe he just liked those fonts. <laughs> yeah, yep. Yep. Hey, good on him. Good on you, buddy. Because there there was one time, um, it was quite early on, like very early on, and I was like, why does this feel like a high school production? I felt like I was watching the film <laughs> you had made in, you know, high, uh, in college, um, like the the way the camera moved and the way it was set up. I don't know. It just felt all a bit meh. No offense. Whereas once we got into the crux of the story- I really felt like it took off there as um, proper filmmaking. Early on, it it did not. I actually really love the look of this film. I think that this film is shot really, really nicely. I but think. But can you can you see that there is a definite transition from the early scenes to later? Like the I, opening to scenes me, I of think that's the and- caliber of the acting. I think that possibly. the film really picks up once the lead character Ben comes into it, mm. and I think that his possibly. level of acting is. Is very very strong. And yeah, he, he's amazing. He carries the film to a certain point mm. after he. Appears, well, I thought I Barbara was the main character, and um, yeah, she was slightly irritating. Um, and I, I, I don't know if I missed something, but it wasn't clear to me that that was her brother. I thought. Yeah, they were visiting their parents. That yeah, grave. yeah, yeah. No, no, I get that later. Um, when she says I was visiting my father's grave. And I'm like, wow, your husband really was a dick then about you visiting your husband's grave. And then later she's like, my brother. And I was like, oh, oh, okay, that's okay then. (laughs) But when he's like, she's, you know, kneeling at the grave praying and he's like, oh, come on, baby. Church was this morning, huh? You know, I was like, rude. Um, (laughs) She feels the loss of this person and is saying a little prayer. You should church. (laughs) Only a sibling can say things like that to you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, That's one thing I actually really love about the film as well is the different characterizations. Early on, you were saying that, yeah, you were you were annoyed by Barbara mm. and you felt that- not, a, not, a, not annoyed by her, annoyed by the use of her. And yes. that continues for pretty much all females in the film. Because I disagree. Well, I See, you because would. you thought that she was the main character and you turned to me 20 minutes in and said, she hasn't spoken in 10 minutes. She hasn't spoken since since Ben appeared. Yeah. And I, I was a bit confused by that because I'm like, well, yeah, she's very clearly in shock and traumatised by the- by the death of her brother, but and that continues ben through the arriving, film. She She's was practically a comatose. No, shush. She was a functional human being making really good decisions for herself. She until was until Ben was. turned up, and I, then all of a sudden, and I know, I know this can happen with you know, oh, finally, like, yeah. like an adultier adult is here, um, and you just you know are allowed to fall apart. But she doesn't know Ben from a bar of soap, and. I just don't feel like she would have let her guard down to the point that she would, like the adrenaline would wear off and shock. See, like I, total yeah. shock could I take disagree. over. I disagree. Th- I think it's and a it, bit of that fight no, or flight pissed, response sure. where you just you get to where you can, and then it's like. But okay, another man I've wouldn't have it. acted like that in the film. 
It was because she was female. I disagree. That's one thing that I really like about the film and what why the story works so well to me. It's like your classic Seven Samurai, for example, where it's this group of different people coming together. Men. And, and I think that's why this works so well is that each character is so distinct. Yes, and- but what do the women get to do? When the mother is with her daughter- and then she has to go back upstairs to, you know, help. Um, no, no, it's because they've got a radio up there. And, like, yeah. her husband has been making decisions for her. We'll get that's, to him in a second. Yeah, that's right, though. And she has such disdain for him. She is the one who's like, you unbarricade that door right now, you cockhead. We're going upstairs. Mm, that's like, not quite what happened, actually. It, it is. No, no. Um, he has had the final word and she just has to accept it because he's the man. It's not until they're like invited up there because the radio is saying something that she's like, come on, please, let's go. And then the other woman who I forget her name, she has to go downstairs and watch the child so the men can listen and then old shock Barbara is just basically comatose on the couch and Mrs. Cooper just kind of gets to be there because why not? But, you know, another woman had to go downstairs. It was the same when they were formulating a plan. Mr. Cooper has to throw the Molotov cocktails out the window and then race downstairs to barricade the door. There are three adult women here in the house that could have done that at the exact same time. But no. I'm with you. And in a more modern- You're not with me. I am. And in a more modern film, that would happen. But we are looking at it through the lens of a 53-year-old film. And you're like, it's progressive. The black guy's the main character. And I'm like, yeah, no, no, cool. I never it's, not, said that. it's not that progressive. The interesting thing about that is that that character was written as a Caucasian. And when they cast Dwayne Jones, they made the decision not to alter the script at all. Um, um, I mean, it didn't need altering. No, that's right. <laughs> like- but the other thing that I find really interesting about the film is that the majority of it is apparently improvised. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, Dwayne Jones's character was initially supposed to be a trucker, and he's supposed to be kind of a little bit dumb, but he's a very intelligent oh. man, and he was like, I wouldn't talk like this. I'm not going to talk like this. And he basically just took hold of saying what he wanted to say, and the rest of the, the actors followed along with that. So, maybe he's not a great actor. Maybe he was just <laughs> being himself. <laughs> um, but I think that that's a really- Interesting way to approach it, really. Mm, maybe. I don't know. I just, I was like, oh, I'm kind of bored of this. Like, I know I'm watching a film that's 53 years old, as you say, and I should expect this, but that doesn't make it interesting to me. Being as old as the film was, were you surprised by the gore in the film? No. Um, what I was surprised by was the weird things sometimes you didn't see. So, if we're showing people eating organs or, you know, what's meant to be organs, if we're showing people um, with gunshots in their head, we're not seeing them shot in the head, but we're seeing gunshots in the head, um, you know, stabbings, all that sort of thing. It's weird that we don't um, see and we've seen people on fire. It's weird then when the car explodes that we don't actually see their bodies alight in the car. It's really odd to me. And there was another part where that couple that dies in the car kissed and you don't actually see the lips connect at all. It's hidden like from both sides, both angles of the camera. I think some of that probably is the first film makerness of it all. Um, just kind of not being sure of what to do. Mm. And I think some of it also comes down to budget and the the reality of how difficult certain things would have been to achieve. You sure. know, as gross and gory as it as it is, showing people eating flesh is pretty easy to do. You mm. get, you know, some kind of meat, you slap it on something that looks like a bone and mm. you get them to chew away. Whereas showing charred bodies in a car, there's that risk of it looking schlocky and cheesy like Christopher Lee in Dracula. (laughs) And so, I guess- No, that looked amazing. (laughs) You just don't need teddy bear eyes on it. (laughs) And so, I guess if you have that that choice to make of, well, 
sure, we could show more, but it might look worse. Sometimes showing less is more, you know, like mm-hmm. like you were saying last week with not seeing the creature until so late into the film. Yeah, sure. I just, I don't know, the, the, the things we didn't see were sort of an odd choice given the things we had seen. Yeah. We had definitely seen people on fire at that point. Yeah. Um, so this film came out before the MPAA had a rating system for films. Oh. So there was a huge controversy about the gratuitous violence and, and gore in the film. Mm. I, yeah, it certainly doesn't hold back for a film of that time. No, I, I remember it's pretty the first tame time I to saw today. this. I remember the first time I saw this thinking how gory it was. Mm. And, you know, even just the- the kind of themes, the idea of cannibalism mm. is and was such a kind of disturbing thought to people mm. that even just that that's where they choose to go. They have that whole sequence of the zombies just feasting. Yeah. Yeah. It, it it's quite gory for the I time. imagine yeah, I imagine it was horrifying to watch at the time when you hadn't been exposed to things like that. Nowadays yeah. it's like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I've seen Squid Game. Um I'm fine. <laughs> I've seen Hunger Games. <laughs> no, not Oh my god, don't say that. <laughs> Cut that. I've seen Game of Thrones. <laughs> I did think the sound effects of the zombie eating the burnt people was very good. I felt like you heard bones breaking. Yeah. And yeah, the general like I was like, Egh. yeah. I, I think that whole scene is horrific. That sequence of them, it is, yeah, just tearing those organs. And I think there's some that look a little cheesy. There's one who's eating some kind of long bowel or intestine or something that you know it looks a little bit like sausage casing. <laughs> um, but then the shot immediately following that is one eating a heart, and I swear you see that thing beating as he's about to bite into it, and it's mm. very effective. Yeah. I think that the effects and the the general look of this film hold up really, really, really well. And I think that, as I said, most of that comes down to the very clever design that the antagonists just look like people. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, But I think that all of the gore sequences do hold up really well. When Ben stabs that zombie in the head with the pipe and you see him pull the pipe out and there is a literal hole Mm. in the zombie's head, Mm. that's- that looks very effective. Mm, it does, yep. You even, you were like, did you see that? And I was like, no, because I think I'd been looking down at my drink or the food or something at that point, And you took it back for me. Yeah. Just to prove a point that, yes, in fact, it was an amazing film and it looked great. <laughs> I like simple lighting. I know that about myself. <laughs> <laughs> You're a simple man. I, and and that- you like simple lighting because it's what you would do. <laughs> it is what I would do. <laughs> if Topher was here, he'd be like, oh, mate. Topher would actually turn lights on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I I love I love natural lighting, which is why I love low budget cinema. Because I don't think that's what you're supposed to do in your government job, though. <laughs> <laughs> Just quietly. I I I love that look. I th- I think that the lighting of this film is really, really, really nice. Like, could they have done more stylized lighting? Like, could this film play with more shadows and stuff? I yeah, think there was probably. a lot of shadow play. Uh, for me, it was just that opening scene of it being broad daylight and then them adding lightning. And I was like, what, guys, this is very clearly not what's happening right now. It ruined it for me. The The other lighting later on, um, particularly uh, like z- the zombies' faces through yeah trees and stuff like that was, was good for me. Yeah. Um, the lighting downstairs in the cellar. What the fuck was that? Could it be any brighter? It was. Yeah, it was very bright in that cellar. Yeah, and I guess that it's is a cellar. <laughs> that is the one problem with natural lighting is when you go into a room like a cellar, mm. it's going to be too dark for the camera to actually pick anything up. So you have to do fake lighting. Yeah, but there. I don't know. They. I feel like there would have been a way to do it better. Probably. What I did appreciate though. Um, was that there was no holds barred for the main characters. Mm. They all die. Yeah. Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. Um, Every single one. Did you see that coming? Yes. Once I saw Barb die and I was like, oh, how ironic. After all that, he locks himself in the cellar with Mr. Cooper and um, is – is safe there after they had argument after argument after argument about where would be safer to hide. He ends up being in the cellar and he is safe until 
it's funny, he's rescued. And I'm like, this is why you don't leave it to Hicks. Because they're like, oh, look, there's one. Shoot him. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, poor buddy. You almost made it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit dire, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I imagine that's what critics have picked apart over the years as well. Um, and he's like, oh, no, that didn't mean anything. <laughs> Yeah, the film came out right around the time of the Martin Luther King assassination as well. So yeah. there was there were a lot of critics kind of putting a- those two things together. Yeah, yeah. And he has confirmed that that was not what he was going for. Yeah, he claims that he actually didn't hear about that assassination until he the film was finalised and he was looking for a distributor. Mm, okay. I mean, I appreciate him being like, no, actually, you know, that's sorry, that's not what I was going for. Yeah. I know you'll be all over it. Oh, the lighting of this film was amazing. I really love the look of it. But the thunder and lightning at the start when they're um, at the gravesite and then, like, the zombies sort of start happening straight away, I was like, uh, it's clearly bright out. There's clearly no rain. There's clearly no – I was like, come on, guys, you don't have to add that to add suspense to what's happening. Yeah, I think – Oh, what I think it adds is a little bit of mystery as to where these creatures came from, you know? Like, it. I, one thing I don't like about the film is that it's explained. I actually don't love that halfway through we get the explanation about radiation. Mm. And, like, and to me it takes away that impact as well. You know, there's that whole subplot with the little girl who's been bitten and there's the fear that she might turn. Mm. And about halfway through, we get this realisation that, well, it it actually doesn't matter if she was bitten or not. It's not a disease they're passing on. They literally state through the news broadcast that anyone who dies of any cause for any reason will reanimate. I kind of liked that, though, because it just added to sort of the um, reality of the situation unfolding. You know, you don't know anything, then you do know a bit, and then you do know a bit more. Yeah. Like, we've lived through something like that at the moment where I was like, we have to go back to washing our grocery bags. And you were like, we don't have to do that anymore. (laughs) Yeah. I guess I just, to me, I wish that there was more- I like when things are unclear and unexplained, especially something like this. I think the more you try to explain something like zombies, the kind of sillier and cheesier it gets. And I think that this movie does such a good job of staying away from being campy or cheesy, See, which is really it was easy that to do. Stuff that made me feel less and less like it was cheesy. I really? felt at the start like it was cheesy, and then I got more into it as it went on. Yeah, so it right. had the opposite effect for me. I hated, and I've said this before, um, that you know we had a moment of these two characters kind of setting a stage for us. Like, you know, I, I thought he was her husband. I didn't realise they were brother and sister. But, you know, we've we've got some kind of um, mildly heartfelt moment. They're at her father's grave and then the killing starts. And I was like, ugh, I hate that. I, I understand maybe for the time it was quite shocking that all of a sudden here we are, we're in the throes of it. I just – I didn't care for anyone at that point. And then she's the survivor and I'm like, okay, cool. Wow, look at her go. Like she's she's out running this stupid zombie. Um, she's making decisions for herself. And then Ben turns up and she turns into a simpering idiot. And I was back to thinking, no, I'm not interested anymore. It wasn't until there was more actual plot of the situation unfolding that I was invested. So you, you brought it up just then actually where you were talking about her making good decisions. Hmm. And I agree with you. And one thing that I really, really love and appreciate about the film is that so many horror films after about 10 minutes in only exist because the characters make bad decisions. Bad decisions, yeah. This film does the opposite of that. Every single character at every single turn, I think, makes a very real decision. And for the most part, they're the decisions I would make too, I think. I would hope you wouldn't make the decisions that Mr. Cooper makes. Well, no, I wouldn't. guys are- But I'm sure that, like, you know people like him, right? (laughs) Yeah. One of our, well, no, no, your friends, yeah, of. one yeah. of your friends in particular, yes. Yeah. And I I would hope I would never get stuck in an apocalyptic situation with him. Yeah, but that's Because what I-, I would murder him first before I attacked any other decision maker. But yeah, like, that's what I mean. Like, I think that every decision here rings very true to the characters. And yeah, that- That early scene where Barbara is escaping and she is making smart choices. She gets in the car. She locks the door. So many horror movie characters wouldn't do that. Mm. Even the simple decision. She doesn't have the keys. 
what does she do? I'm on a hill. I'll pull off the parking brake and let the car roll away. Yeah. Yep. Like, that is such a smart choice. Yep. Even, until, even later until on. Until Ben arrives. And then, and then she finally starts to process things and he says to her, why don't you just calm down? You should <laughs> yeah. calm down. Um, and then- She's Again, a very real decision. I would say the same thing. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> then I would kill you. Um, and then she's getting to the point where she's starting to sort of come back to the reality of the situation. And she's like, we should leave. Obviously, it is her trauma talking. But here she is being a person again, not just someone who's like comatose and in shock. And he ignores her like she's completely invisible. And then- And then she kind of, like, gives him a light little slap. It was very light. And he, like, fucking pounds her. What the hell was that about? I was not on Ben's side, let me tell you. Yeah. Yeah. I liked Ben a lot, but I did not like him when Barbara was around. (laughs) And again, I I think that that just lends itself to these all being real characters. I think they do good things, they do bad things, but I think they're always- making decisions that I think are pretty true to the characters as they're written or or presented to us. Sure. Yep. Maybe. Let's talk about the quote-unquote zombies, or should I say ghouls. Ghouls. (laughs) So, very clearly zombies as we know them today. But as I said, this was the first modern zombie film. I think you mean living in paired. (laughs) (laughs) And zombies were very different back then. Zombie is a Haitian word. Um, Really? Yeah, wow, yeah. So zombies, you know, they are reanimated dead, but they were usually of Caribbean descent. They were, um, you know, like in the the very old monster movies, they were kind of um, like dead servants, kind of like Igor type creatures. And you know, I guess like to a certain extent, even Frankenstein would be considered a zombie. Really, he's a reanimated dead. Um. And so, when Romero wrote this film, he made the decision not to use the word zombie, as he didn't see these creatures as zombies. He wanted Mm -hmm. to separate them from what came before. Mm -hmm. And this movie just became so iconic that this is now what we think of as the modern zombie. Mm. Um, So, you weren't scared by them, though. Oh, God, no. No. Even when there were tons and tons of them at the end, when they they took down the house? I mean- if it were me in that situation, I would feel scared, but I didn't feel scared watching it. Yeah. I was like, guys, just run, like, really fast. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're pretty useless. What is interesting, though, is for the most part, they seem, like, completely dense. Um, They're just like, uh, yeah. and walking along at a slow pace. They never pick up the pace. They- um. They they only seem to be able to react to what's directly in front of them. But then every so often they had the forethought to actually yeah. pick up a rock. I know. Yeah, it's interesting. They make actual decisions in yeah, this Yeah. So, I don't know. I, I I didn't like the consistency of it's that, It's a to bit be unclear as to, as to how, I guess, dead or, or to what extent their brains are working. I Maybe. mean, it's clear that they need a brain because that's how you kill them is by shooting them in the head. Mm. Um, and actually, that is the one- like I said, I, I think for the most part, they make good decisions in this film. I think pretty early on, Ben should have figured out to aim for the head. And he doesn't. Every single time well, he shoots them in the chest and it's like, mate, No, but then on. he did shoot one in the head and it stayed down. And I was like, okay, come yeah, on, exactly. Ben. So keep doing that, fuck's, mate. Fuck's sake, Ben, stop wasting bullets. Yeah, yeah. Oh, fucking Ben. I mean, <laughs> no, I quite liked Ben, but I didn't like Ben. Um, But yeah, so- This is where we get the kind of slow, shambling zombie. What I think is really interesting is early on when Barbara first encounters Ben and he says to her, you know, there's only two out there. I can I can take them. Mm. And he does. He goes out there and he kills the zombies. Mm. And I think that that really shows us. And I like that the film makes that decision to say, yeah. These guys are easy to kill if there's only one or two of them. The problem is when there's when you're overcome by them. But then, like, I understand he needed the key for the gas pump, right? And that was the whole, I guess, um, impetus to boarding up the house until they could 
find the key perhaps it's unclear it, it, like if you're think- taking two down and then in the end you're just going to shoot the pump off anyway why didn't you go when there were just the two i don't think his i don't think his plan was to look for the key he went to that house because he saw the gas pump but he couldn't get it, so he decided just to hide in the house. Was the way I read it. No, he definitely. I think mentioned his plan. I think his plan point. was literally what happens in the to end. I think help. his plan was to wait for help. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. He de- he definitely mentions it at one point, and then decides to board up the house instead. And I'm like, well, but then you find the gun, and there's only like, as you say, five or six out there at that point. And he could have just taken him and Barbara, left useless Mister Cooper. And the daughter who was going to become a zombie anyway. I mean, I felt sorry for his wife. And I did feel like when she was um, (laughs) being, you know, um, sort of almost choked by zombies at the door, she could have maybe just stepped forward and would have been fine. (laughs) No, mate. There were like 10 zombies gripping her neck. No, there weren't. There was a couple gripping her clothes and then there was just lots of hands flailing everywhere. (laughs) And she's like, oh, oh," and I'm like, love, just step forward. There you go. Problem Uh, solved. At what point did you see it coming that the little girl was going to zombify? Oh, straight away. Yeah. 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 When they were like, you know, I don't know what's I don't know what's wrong with her. And I was like, mm, clearly she's gonna turn into a zombie guy. So like Yeah. I do I do like the the foreshadowing there though. You gotta remember that this was like this was like the first time. You know, now mm, sure. now it's so common to us if you get bit by a zombie, you turn into a zombie. Yeah. I love the simple foreshadowing though, that the first thing we hear is is him asking her, Oh, where did you get the gauze? And her, you know, saying that she ripped some curtains or something. Like there's no explanation for what the gauze is for. We mm-hmm. know that the little girl has been injured somehow, and in our heads we immediately go, Oh fuck. Like <laughs> right at that moment, I was like well, shit, <laughs> she's going to eat some motherfuckers. Were you? Because I was like, mm, okay. <laughs> oh, look, she's a zombie. <laughs> I'm just pissing you off now. I'm you just, are. I'm just yeah. taunting you. <laughs> look, it's fine. I, I, I can completely recognise this as an amazing piece of cinema history. If I was in 19, whatever it was, watching this, I would have been like, holy shit. But now I'm just like, okay. Good job, guys. Okay. So, it's clear to me then that we've ended Spooktober on a fizzle. (laughs) We went out with a whimper instead of a bang, I guess. (laughs) How are you scoring this? The zombies that once plagued our town are just people (laughs) running in the street now. Hooray! (laughs) Um, Look, I can see that it was amazing for its time. So, I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10. Because and and I I appreciated the no holds barred on sparing main characters' lives. I you know that's that's incredibly modern for the time. Um, would I have liked if that had meant something and he was trying to make a political statement? Maybe, but I also respect him for saying, "Nah, I, that's not what I was doing." Yeah, seven, I guess. I love this film. I think this film holds up incredibly incredibly well and the sequel well the first two sequels are really good as well and after that there's just too many movies <laughs> you know what else is really good which i should have shown you but i knew would be too scary for you is the remake of the sequel dawn of the dead hmm. um which was written by james gunn and directed by Zack snyder i would watch that I think that would be too scary for you. Really? And it continues the basic setup of this. There's a group of people, but instead of being trapped in a farmhouse, they're trapped in a in a mall. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's it's- way too many exits to man. Well, exactly. I would be on Mr. Cooper's side then, <laughs> and I would never want to be on Mr. Cooper's side. Um, and I think you would find that one too scary, but maybe I could sneak it past you. Test me out, mate. Come on. Okay. Um, Come at me, bro. But I think this film holds up incredibly well. I think that it is still beautiful to look at. I think it's fun to watch. I, I'm a nine out of ten on this movie. Oh, look at me. I'm Billy and I'm a film reviewer. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for joining us for Spooktober. I hope that you had some fun and I hope that you had some fun, Noose. I did. I, I did. Hope, I hope you learned that not all horror is terrible. Even <laughs> Hashtag if not all th- horrors, Billy. Even if you thought that this film was. <laughs> I didn't think it was terrible. No, I, I gave it a seven. I heard you. You think it's shit. I heard it. Oh, my God. It's not my choice of film. You knew that when you chose it. Okay. Give me more American werewolves in London. Okay. All right. Poltergeist. (laughs) 
All right. Or Kanunu in the vampire film, please. Next week, I will be joined by the legendary Paul from the Countdown Movie and TV Reviews podcast. And we're going to be looking at another spooky film. It continues, I guess, with Halloween Kills. Um, But we've got a big November coming up. After that, I'll be joined by Sam from Movie Reviews and 20 Qs looking at Eternals. Topher is going to make a triumphant return to the pod as we talk about 84's Dune. Triumphant is yet to be seen. Let's just (laughs) say a return. Uh, Will he be able to top my charisma? Probably not. And then we'll round out the month doing Red Notice with the lads from Netflix and Swill. And last night in Soho with Paul from Film Busters. So some films I'm really looking forward to. So that's going to be fun. All right. In the meantime, if you want to get in touch with me, you can do that at wewatchedathing.com or wewatchedathing at gmail.com. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, all under the handle <laughs> at wewatchedathing. If you want to help support the show, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash wewatchedathing. And I'll catch you next week. See you, Halloweenies. You're still here? The the show's over. Go home. Go. But if you can't get enough of We Watched a Thing, why don't you check out our Patreon page? There's tons of behind-the-scenes content, heaps of bonus episodes. You can get full, unedited videos of each episode recording. You can pick a movie for me to do on the show, or even come and join me while I talk about it. So why don't you head over to patreon.com forward slash we watched a thing. Go watch a movie.